I want to start by declaring a little bit of an interest. Um, I'm the chair of Hungate Medieval Art, which has a, a small walk-on part in the story I'm telling today. But I first got to know the church as a historian working on an EU-funded research project. Those were the days about religious heritage back in 2017, when I began then to research Hungate's history. It is a long, remarkable, distinguished history, but perhaps unusually, the most remarkable of things that happened to this medieval church took place in the early 20th century, when it was at the center of a groundbreaking experiment, which is the focus of my talk. Um, let's start with the building itself. It stands on the quiet corner uh, that is formed by Elm Hill and Princess Street, just up from the Wensum and Tombland. It's an incredibly rich historical landscape. Within, let's say, 150 yards, there are four other medieval churches, St Andrews, St Michael at Cleese, St George Tombland, and St Simon and St Jude. There's Blackfriars, the Dominican Priory, the glorious mix of merchant housing on Elm Hill and Princess Street, there's Brit the Britain Arms, the Congregationalist Church built by Edward Boardman, the sites of the Boys Model School, which are all marked on this map, but there's also Haldenstein's shoe factory too. And these are just a few of the highlights. Francis Bloomfield, the 18th century antiquarian, describes St. Peter Hungate with his usual brevity as a neat building of black flint, which rather neatly encapsulates two aspects of its construction the flintwork of the tower and nave, and its symmetrical plan. Flint is used in several ways, including some lovely sections of squared flint. The nave and chancels substantially rebuilt were part of the mid 15th century rebuilding, executed probably under the leadership of the Paston family who had a house on Elm Hill, and the tower and the porch survived from earlier phases. The interior comes as a surprise to many visitors, for the church is TARDIS-like, apparently larger on the inside than out. The effect of its undivided symmetrical interior, the very large nave windows, and its scant furnishings. When Bloomfield visited the church in the first half of the 18th century, and when James Sillett drew this in the 1820s, the interior probably looked something like this. This was drawn in 1849 before the church underwent considerable alteration in the 1850s. There is this evocative photograph of the exterior of Hungate from the second half of the 19th century. Unfortunately, we don't know the photographer nor the date. Um, and I'd like you to notice the tower because uh, that features very shortly. Um, I haven't been able to find a late 19th century um, drawing of the interior or photograph for that matter. But what we can be confident about is that the box pews that we saw here were removed, replaced by benches, and the additional steps that are there now uh, were added at this time. And over the next 30 years, Hungate became a popular church with a congregation drawn to the ritualist style that was adopted there with its surplus choir and use of incense, 
as well as the preaching of the Reverend William Hull. However, not everything was well at Hungate, and cracks began to appear, almost certainly literally. There were, it was found, serious problems with the tower, which was apparently in danger of collapse, a threat to life and limb. Among the parish records kept here at the Archive Centre, there is some correspondence about the tower. Letters to and from the Reverend Hull, the incumbent, Archdeacon Perone, the architect and diocesan surveyor Edward Preston Willens, and Bishop Pelham, who gave his blessing to Williams and Perone's plan, which was simply to shorten the tower, as this was the cheapest way of repairing it. Now, this exchange illustrates how um, repair and what was called, and I want you to imagine inverted commas, restoration was managed before the 20th century in negotiation between people who knew each other well and with no external oversight. Bishop, archdeacon, architect and the incumbent worked things out between them. There was no statutory obligation on any of them to preserve the historic fabric, nor to keep the historic decorations and furnishings that still survived either. These were the days before diocesan advisory committees, national listing and recording schemes, and all the other apparatus we have now to preserve our heritage. Now, it was just this kind of transaction against which Philip Webb, I just need to move on, um, Philip Webb and William Morris had begun to campaign about 10 years before, and which the Society for the Projection of Ancient Buildings was founded to counter. They rejected what seemed to them cavalier restorations of churches that had begun to take place in huge numbers across the country from the 1840s. When, as at St Giles in Norwich, original medieval windows were removed, replaced by new ones uh, in a different but apparently more correct style. Or when, as at Hungate, restorations removed, removed medieval and later fabric for similar reasons and without recording it. As William Morris laid out in a letter to the Athenaeum, in which he called for the foundation of the SPAB uh, to keep a watch on old monuments. Our ancient buildings are not mere ecclesiastical toys, but sacred monuments of the nation's growth and hope. This is an extraordinary and I think rather beautifully constructed sentence. Notice how Morris places the words ecclesiastical toys in the first phrase close to sacred monuments in the second. This proximity encourages us to compare and contrast the words ecclesiastical with sacred and toys with monuments. Morris thus argues, and I think perhaps tries to convince us, perhaps he does, that the church is not to be trusted with the nation's history and heritage, and that the buildings are sacred, not for religious reasons, but for secular ones. In the famous SPAB manifesto written in the same year, Webb and Morris appealed for preservation and conservation not restoration, in order that ancient buildings, and I quote, could be instructive, and here's another of those words usually associated with religion, venerable, to those that come after us. 
Webb and Morris's manifesto marked a maturing of heritage thinking that can be traced back at least to the end of the 18th century. And I'll come back to these ideas in a little while. But while these ideas were being promulgated and the SPAB gathered popular support for its ideas, Hungate's troubles were multiplying. In 1897, Hungate appeared in a series of EDP articles under the title Crumbling Churches. The picture painted by the article suggests Hungate's situation was pretty dire, although perhaps not as bad as that of St Mary Cosney, for example. But the article reported that for two years, the roof of the chancel had been covered by a tarpaulin and that the stained glass had been removed for its safety. Photographs taken a few years later, perhaps five or six years later, um, tell the story. Hungate appears broken, close to collapse. And these photographs seem to speak of an utter disregard for the building. But that would be an unfair assessment. There were a number of factors which played a part in bringing this situation about, and two of them stand out, both, by the way, out of the control of the diocese or indeed the parish. Firstly, the city centre of Norwich was changing. People were moving out to the developing suburbs, leaving behind impoverished parishes, their places taken by businesses and leaving behind those who could not afford to move. And secondly, and crucially, money to maintain churches, which had for centuries been raised by a compulsory rate on the residents of a parish, was from 1868 made a matter of voluntary contribution. This hit poor parishes like Hungate hard. So how did the, the diocese respond? Well, their response was very practical. The parish would be merged with its neighbour, St Michael at Please, and the building would be declared redundant and then partly or wholly demolished and the land sold. This was actually their only option unless another sustainable religious purpose such as a parish hall or school could be found. But in such an over-churched place as Norwich Centre, City Centre had become, an alternative use was unlikely to be found. Indeed, only 20 years before, St Peter Southgate on King Street had been made redundant and par partially demolished. Um, this is a rather touching illustration by Bosworth Harcourt, which says at the bottom, um, about to be pulled down, and it gives the date, 21st of November, 1882. Um, so, this is where we were. If a use couldn't be found, um, the, the church would have to be demolished. But as in these early years of the 20th century that we've now reached, as Hungate continued to disintegrate, the heritage lobby was gathering pace. The SPAB had become increasingly active in protecting churches from demolition. And locally, people including churchmen began to speak up in support of, of trying to save churches like Hungate. But how could it be done? Fortunately, Hungate's plight came to the attention of Prince Frederick Duleep Singh, who was an active member of the SBAB and a lay Anglican. Acting as an intermediary, Duleep Singh gathered local and national support for preserving and restoring the building. 
which allowed the diocese to withdraw their plans to dilapidate. There were social events to raise money and scholars like James Gardner, the editor of the Paston Letters, wrote in support of the scheme. But what's really important to recognize here is that this support depended not on the church's religious function, but on its historic features, its angel roof, its remaining stained glass, and so on, and on its relationship, its association with the Paston family. In other words, on its aesthetic and heritage value. Clearly, no convincing case could be made for its religious value. And it became, at this moment, to use William Morris's words, a sacred monument of the nation's history. So the SBAB obtained from one of its supporters a promise to underwrite the costs, and they undertook the restoration of the church on the condition that their own architect, William Weir, was in charge of the work. Weir had trained with Philip Webb, and I believe he was later to be involved in work to save the buildings on Elm Hill. So the work went ahead, and after it was do done, and despite the union of the parish with St Michael at Please, the church reopened for worship in 1908. What else could it be used for? Unfortunately, as was surely predictable, it was, no, it was not long before services ceased again, probably because the few remaining parishioners had settled into worshiping at St. Michael at Please, while the church had been close to derelict and during the restoration. So again, the hunt for alternative religious uses began. This time, for a while, one was found. It was used as a drill hall by the church's lads and church's girls brigade, a uniformed church organization founded in the 1890s. But this turned out not to be a suitable use, for the fabric of the church was being damaged and the bishop had to order it to stop. In the late 1920s, again, it was discovered that the building was in need of immediate repair. And despite its heritage value having been proved 20 years before, Again, the church could only advance redundancy and dilapidation as solutions. But by this time, they did so in a completely changed heritage environment. Nationally and locally, a flowering of national and local heritage organizations had taken place. In Norwich, as plans for slum clearance and modernization began to be instigated, several heritage groups were founded. The Friends of Norwich Museums in 1921, the Norwich Society in 1923, the Norfolk Archaeological Trust in 1924, and the city gained two new museums, Bridewell and Strangers Hall, in this same period. The membership of these societies overlapped and with the Norfolk and Norwich Archaeological Society, which had been founded in 1846. The records of these organisations, as well as the town clerk's papers and museum committee minutes, which are kept here, show how concerned local people had become about the potential loss of historic fabric of the city including of church buildings. So for example, as the Norwich Society fought to save Elm Hill, they petitioned both formally and informally parochial and diocesan authorities 
about the poor condition of the churches at both ends of Elm Hill, St. Peter Hungate and St. Simon and Jude. But they could do absolutely nothing about these buildings without the church's cooperation. And similar things were happening elsewhere. And the Church of England was coming under increasing moral pressure to recognize the historic value of their buildings to local communities and to the nation. A system of diocesan advisory committees was put in place by the Church of England just before the First World War, and a central body was soon founded after the war, now the Church Buildings Council. Now, while some churchmen had little sympathy for the heritage cause, believing that the church's evangelical mission was paramount, there were historically and aesthetically minded churchmen and lay people like Duleep Singh, who found demolition and dilapidation regrettable, even by this point intolerable. Informal partnerships between churchmen, parishioners, architect architects and historians began to develop as had happened at Hungate to help restore historic churches. But the question of the unsustainability of worship or other religious uses remained unsolved and therefore the probability well, the possibility, actually near probability, of demolition remained as the only solutions. If religious uses could not be found, those buildings were useless to the church, and the money they might raise, although demolition wasn't cheap, could be used, for example, to contribute to building new churches in the new suburbs. And indeed, Norwich is surrounded actually by some really um, excellent examples of those. Nevertheless, believing that the church, Hungate, was as a heritage building worth saving, members of the NNAS, the Norwich Society, the diocese, the SBAB, and the corporation came together to try to find a solution to try to save St. Peter Hungate yet again. The solution they came up with can be stated very, very briefly. The building would be transferred via a lease to the management of the town council for use as a museum of ecclesiastical art. Now, this, it, I hope, is not an anticlimax. Um, it doesn't sound like a very big step, does it? But bear with me. The idea for the museum may have been Frank Laney's, who was the curator of the Castle Museum, who had been to Paris with the Museums Association in 1921. And it's likely that he visited at least one of the churches there that had been given different purposes during the French Revolution, during their campaign of secularization, such as the Musée des, des Arts et Métiers. Um, I think this is a wonderful photograph. Um, there were considerable obstacles in the way of this influential group of Nor Norwich citizens. There were legal objections to be overcome in cooperation with the ecclesiastical commissioners who were eventually persuaded by the town clerk, Noel Rudd, among others, to adopt a liberal interpretation of the current legislation, which allowed for educational reuse by the church. As well as this, the building needed repair, as I've, I mentioned, funds had to be raised, and the town council needed to be assured of the proposal's financial viability. After five years' work of planning, negotiating and fundraising, led largely by Colonel Buller, a significant local figure who sat on the Town Council's Museum Committee, 
the St. Peter Hungate Museum of Ecclesiastical Art was opened on the 27th of June, 1933 by Bishop Pollock. So why was this? Why am I saying this is a big deal? Well, it was for the first time since the Reformation, um, the first Anglican church building that was given in perpetuity to a secular authority for a non-religious purpose. And this amounted to a redrawing of a boundary long maintained between the religious and the secular in English culture. Such a transformation could not have happened without the support of the Bishop of Norwich, Bertrand Pollock. He welcomed the proposal cautiously at first, but with growing commitment, marking this by giving his Episcopal staff to the museum on his retirement in 1942. At the opening ceremony, which was covered in the national as well as the local press, um, the bishop gave a remarkable speech in which he said, I do not consider that this little gem of a church is being divorced from its original purpose when it is being constituted a repository of ecclesiastical art. Let us not say to ourselves, the city dwelling population is so much reduced that these churches can go. What a capital idea to find some use for a derelict place of worship. We will rather hope that in a new way, it will do some of its former spiritual work. We will ask that it may be still a house of God, teaching the things of God through the eye, if no longer through the ear. After he finished his speech, as the EDP reported, a richly symbolic gesture was enacted when the bishop vacated the chair and the remainder of the ceremony was presided over by Colonel Buller. So it was that this small church's transformation from a religious to a secular building was completed. And crucially, a way had been opened for other churches to be used for non-religious purposes. That this president was a substantial one was recognized at the time, despite the rather cautious terms in which Bishop Pollock had expressed it. An editorial in The Listener, a magazine published by the BBC, which had become an authoritative voice on cultural matters, argued in 1932 ahead of the museum's opening. An interesting and highly practical solution of the problem of utilizing city churches in areas where there are too many or where the population has moved comes from Norwich, where the Church of St. Peter Hungate is to be transferred to the City Corporation for use as an ecclesiastical museum. Within the boundaries of the city are something over 50 churches, many of them planned on the most ambitious scale. As the city becomes more and more of a business centre and workers tend to live on the fringe, a number of these churches, as is the case in London and other big cities, are naturally becoming redundant. The churches, many of which stand on land which has increased in value all too frequently, fall into the hands of the housebreaker to make way for palatial blocks of offices. As an alternative to demolition, there must be many uses to which these buildings can be put to provide practical justification, if that be needed, for saving them. So the president that Hungate was setting was recognized as groundbreaking, but the expression the author here uses there must be many uses 
suggests a certain hope, if not a certainty about what those many uses might be. The question of suitability, of appropriateness, one with which we are still dealing, was alive from the very start. And this is something um, I will return to. At first, the museum opened for special exhibitions, uh, but gradually a permanent collection was built up from other museums, from donations, from individuals and parishes, and it was supplemented by loans from the V&A and other places, and its displays altered over the years. And these are just two of the actually quite quite um, uh, frequent um, alterations to the ways the collections were displayed. Um, it was a successful m museum. It had its own guidebook and um, a history of the church. The precedent that had been set in 1933 was not forgotten. For example, in 1958, the Archbishops of Canterbury and York appointed a commission to consider, and I quote, problems arising in connection with churches regarded as redundant, but having a claim to preservation on historic or architectural grounds, and to make recommendations as to the procedures for handling such matters and the financial problems involved. Among the evidence the Commission received from government departments, churchmen and heritage organisations, alongside John Betjeman and Ivor Bulmer Thomas, who was a leading activist in the cause of preserving redundant churches, was that provided by the Royal Dean of Norwich, the Reverend Hawthorne. Now, unfortunately, I have yet to locate a record of the evidence he gave, but it is very striking that of the two examples of successful reuses of Anglican churches mentioned in the report of the commission, one was the use of All Saints Camden Town, by the Greek Orthodox Church, so that is another religious use. The other was St Peter Hungate, described in the report as a city church in a city of many ancient churches, far more than are now required. St Peter's is an instance of successful adaptation to another purpose. It is now a museum of ecclesiastical art. Now, by successful, I believe the commissioners meant to communicate two things. First, the alternative use had proved both sustainable and that it was appropriate. The report noted elsewhere that alternative uses should be found that were seemly. And this meant still alternative religious uses or, as the report put it, other suitable secular purposes. So by the time this report came out, the museum had been open for more than 25 years. However, some 40 years later, in 2001, it was closed in cuts to the County Council's culture budget. The argument was that savings had to be made and recalling two by now familiar themes of this story, that both visitor numbers were down and the building required considerable work to make it fit for purpose. Again, there was a, another search for another use. Various tenancies were tried until the late Anthony Bonds developed the idea of Hungate medieval art, which opened in 2009. 
the idea was and still is to encourage people to enjoy and learn about medieval art. The focus at the beginning uh, was on stained glass, as you can see from this spread here. Over the past 15 years, a variety of historical themes have been explored and a programme of contemporary art, usually made in response to the building or to medieval themes, has been set in train. This alternate use has not been easy to maintain either. Money is still tight both for us and for the NHCT, who are the building's landlords. And the question of seemliness is also still very much alive, as we respect and remember the building's previous uses as church and museum, and I'll, I'll come back to this shortly. But what I want to do now is to draw all this together. I've explored Hungate's history here in two substantial historical contexts, the development of heritage thinking and practice and of secularization. I have shown how Hungate moved on two scales of value, one old, one new, of religious and of heritage value. Both are still relevant. Hungate is now, and has been for nearly a century, a secular building. Hungate Medieval Art is a secular organization. But what is certain, and this was true for the museum too, that its heritage value, its heritage and identity are dependent on this religious past. That past is valued by visitors and many come, some with religious conviction, most without, in search of beauty, spiritual uplift, even of transcendence. As Philip Larkin wrote in his poem, Church Going, um, and this poem is set in a church, he was a, he was a frequent church visitor, he considered his own lack of faith and the questions of secularization and redundancy. And he suggested, a serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blent air all our compulsions meet, are recognized and roped as destinies. And that much never can be obsolete. Now, whether full of faith like Bishop Pollock, uncertain like Philip Larkin, or an atheist as William Morris was to become, buildings like Hungate are not toys, but places capable of moving us to joy, to introspection, and perhaps to gratitude. And in this case, gratitude to the bishop, the lieutenant colonel, the town clerk, and the museum curator, who among others recognized Hungate's worth, and that it was indeed, and I hope still is, far from obsolete. Thank you all very much for your attention.